More than 65 years ago, acclaimed photographer Gordon Parks set out to shoot a series depicting the realities of life under segregation with some very personal stories. The series was supposed to run in Life magazine, but it never saw the light of day until Museum of Fine Arts curator Karen Haas recently dug into their history. WGBH News arts editor Jared Bowen has the story. It's always just been called young African-American couple in front of segregated movie theater. Didn't have a firm date. We didn't know anything about it. This was the picture that launched the Museum of Fine Arts' Karen Haas on a curatorial quest to learn what brought photographer Gordon Parks back to Fort Scott, Kansas, his hometown, in 1950. He had the power to go back and tell the stories of African-American families, these friends of his, people who trusted him, who would look right into his camera and, you know, uh, really believed that he would do right by them, that he had this opportunity to sort of counter all the stereotypes of African-Americans. This exhibition comprises the photographs Parks took on assignment for Life magazine. He had pitched the story to return home to Kansas for an extremely personal take on segregation. He decides to go back and seek out his um, classmates from elementary school to look at where their lives had gone and what their experience has been in the 20 plus years since he'd seen them. It wasn't easy for Parks to return home. Kansas and Fort Scott had been rife with racism throughout his hard scrabble childhood. He was the youngest of 15 children. He, uh, his father was a tenant farmer, his mother was a maid. Um, he described his life as having been discriminated against and really felt a need to get away. As he tracked down his classmates some 20 years after he'd last seen them, he found that nearly all had moved away, some to Chicago's south side. He found one friend, Maisel, who was in very dire straits, and he described her as the class tragedy. She was living with an abusive husband um, who actually held up Gordon Parks with a, with a gun and took all his money. She was the exception. By and large, Parks found his classmates, like himself, had improved their lives. Some people were living uh, very middle class lives, but nearly all of the families that he met with were living in mostly African American neighborhoods. And the sad part for me was that recently in revisiting those neighborhoods and trying to find those homes to go back to the place to get a sense for myself of what they looked like, they're very changed today. Haas retraced Park's trip last year. Like Parks, her intent was personal too, and tinged with sadness for the homes no longer standing. I really have become obsessed with this story. I feel as though these are people I've come to know through reading Gordon Parks' uh, notes, reading his notebooks, going through his um, correspondence, um, looking through the contact sheets, studying the images. I'm really fascinated by these people's lives. I'm realizing in the process of this research how little I know of this moment in history. It was really fascinating and really eye-opening. Jared, I'm kind of slack-jawed looking at those images. It's, it's hard to shift to conversation. Well, I mean, Adam, I will tell you, this is one of my favorite stories in a long time because it's just all of the elements come together. Just fantastic storytelling on the part of Karen Haas. You have a curator who is just so personally invested in this piece. And then I find these images just so riveting. In fact, there's the, the one photograph of the couple and the man has a cigar hanging out of his mouth that I think will probably stay with me for the rest of my life. That last shot that we saw, I think it was, uh, looked like a deathbed shot the intimacy of access there and and coupling that with the looks on the face of the people who were looking into the camera with this warmth that I'm not a photography connoisseur but I'm not accustomed to seeing that sort of direct um, direct inviting look uh, that that openness it just it kind of blew me away well first of all you're right that was a deathbed photograph because it was somebody that he and his family had had a relationship with and you're right that this is the photograph I would just saw that I said I will never leave me but this is a story that only Gordon Parks could tell because growing up in this neighborhood, in this community in Fort Scott that was so rife with racism that it was very, very troubled. Kansas, of course, was sort of at the center of all of this racial strife and being the center of the country and, and being on the dividing yeah, line between... Kansas. Exactly. All of that had come to the fore, and that's why most of his classmates had scattered and they'd gone to other places, many to Chicago, South Side, or St. Louis, Missouri. So there, there were few people that they were going to trust when he came back. And, and 
to some degree, he had to gain trust again, regain trust to, to get entree and to get access to be able to get those pictures. And you see the way they look into his lens and the way they look into that camera, that they are looking at somebody yeah. who they know ha has had a completely and utterly relatable experience that has shaped who they are. So given that we are both marveling at these photographs decades later, why were they buried for so long? Well, this is the fantastic story. So Karen Haas discovered this whole trove, and it was all part of... Gordon Parks had pitched this story to Life magazine. He was one of their up-and-coming photographers and joining the magazine in the late 1940s. He goes there in the 50s. It takes a while to, to track everybody down, to assemble these photographs, and then events start happening. Korea starts happening. And so because of breaking news, they bounced the piece and it never was able to run. By the time they were willing to run the story, their lives had changed so much. When they went back to do their fact checking, they realized that they would have to do the entire piece mm -hmm. over again. So that's really why, although we don't know for certain, probably why it never saw the light of and day. How did Karen Haas find these? It was that one photograph, the one photograph of a couple standing in front of a movie theater. She didn't even know where the movie theater was. I think there was an assumption it was in New York somewhere. So she began to, I mean, she's basically the detective curator. She began to do this sleuthing, and that's how she uncovered this trove. Working but, I mean, with did the she Gordon see that Parks. in Life magazine? Sorry to interrupt, but... No, it was, the, it was the one photograph. In researching the one photograph, because that, that picture of them in front of the movie theater is in the Museum of Fine Arts oh, okay. collection. So okay. she wanted to understand more about what was in that piece. Uh, and this is all part of a, a book that's recently been published by the Museum of Fine Arts looking at their African-American artists. And as she began to trace it, she unraveled this entire oh. story. Before we go, tell me about that piano photo. This is very, very touching, and in fact, it's made Karen Haas very emotional. But the little girl in this fo photograph reached out to Karen Haas once publicity for this show started to appear. And she told Karen Haas, she's a woman who's you know, in her 60s, I believe, now, and she told her that she became everything her mother, who you see seated with her there, she became everything her mother wanted her to be, which goes to the heart of why Gordon Parks did this piece, that African-American families were relatable. They weren't the stereotypes that people were portraying them as in the age of seg segregation, that they had strong, healthy, middle-class lives. That's incredible stuff, Jared. Thank you. Thanks, Adam.